Uh, welcome to Elgin Museum In Conversation. In this episode, we'll be talking about architecture and Elgin's historic buildings with Penny Muir, Associate and RIBA Conservation Accredited Architect for LDN Architects. With experience of a wide range of historic building types, Penny is an award-winning architect who's been involved in numerous projects across Scotland. She graduated from Robert Gordon University in 2008 with a Master's with Distinction in Architecture and has been part of the LDN team since 2011. She's also Chair of Women in Property Network Highlands and Islands branch and is a certified ARB Part 3 examiner. Having carried out surveys throughout Elgin City Centre as part of the recent HES funded CARS project, Penny also has an extensive knowledge and deep understanding of the architecture and streetscape of the historic core and conservation area of Elgin. Penny has been involved with Elgin Museum since 2017 and probably now knows the museum buildings better than the original architects who designed them. This episode is a special episode celebrating the Scottish Civic Trust's Doors Open Days. So welcome Penny to Elgin Museum in Conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for inviting me. That's OK, we're delighted to have you here. So we always start at the beginning, best place to start. Uh, can we ask, was architecture always your planned pathway? Um, no, design's always been a big part of my life, um, but I've also got a big love for animals. Uh, so when I was quite young, I think it was always, oh, I'll, I'll become a vet. Uh, and then actually I quickly realised that I would be useless. <laughs> because I would be too emotionally caught up with all the animals. <laughs> um, so yeah, I started to definitely uh, filter on the design side of things. But interestingly enough, I think what kind of cemented it for me, huh, it's a pun with cement, <laughs> but is that uh, my parents moved up to the Isle of Arran on the West Coast when I was about three years old. And we moved into my grandparents' holiday home and they were, my parents had bought this big range of old farm cottages and farm buildings and they knocked the lot flat and <laughs> built this huge modern thing in the 90s um, and when I was probably about was maybe about 10 or 11 I found the old plans of the buildings and um, I just kept asking questions why you know why 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 do we get rid of these buildings you know why do, why do we move and build this big thing um, well, yeah. we have something really quite quirky with this old building um, and I remember my father's response, who was an engineer, was very much like, oh, but the architect, you know, said there was no way we could save them. And I was like, really? Uh, looking at all the piles of stone that was in the garden now for landscaping and things like that. And I think that kind of just started a bit of a passion within me that, you know, I want to save these old buildings. And, you know, I'm really interested in construction. Again, you know, going up that period from when I was about kind of six we were around a building site, you know, and the house was a building site. We moved into it and some of the rooms still had brick walls because it was being finished and such. So I think it was that the building side was really fascinating. But then it was this, you know, you've just destroyed all these old buildings. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think certainly my mother finds that quite amusing now. It's like, did we start you off on this route? And I was like, well, yeah, I think he did, you know. <laughs> Well, we were going to ask um, if you've always been drawn towards historic buildings because you are a conservation accredited architect and it sounds like you really have always been drawn to the, the older buildings. Have you done a lot of work with um, more modern things or has it always been a focus on the older buildings? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. It was one someone asked me, I think it was last week, what have I worked on a building after 1919? Um, and I had to stop and think, have I? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Inverview House over on the west coast in um, Poole I did that we worked on that gosh I'm trying to think now probably four or five years ago and that was actually really interesting but uh, again it was brickwork with um, brickwork built with lime but then it had the cement render and it had the critter windows so you know that was a little bit of a new one on me critter, metal critter windows in a marine environment but again it was it was actually quite good because it was quite challenging to be like well actually there's parts of this that are concrete you know it's historic concrete we've got to conserve concrete <laughs> as opposed to thinking cement concrete actually this is causing real decay to some of the heritage buildings with the stonework and we need to take it out whereas that was a slightly different one because we actually needed to to save it um, but I think that, again, is the joy about working with old buildings is you don't get the same one twice. You know, you may get ones that have got 
similar floors you know sandstone and cement no, just doesn't go you know you can apply that principle with any kind of sandstone building um but something like that when you're actually like no we need to conserve that because that's the original fabric it can be really quite interesting but I've had another couple of ones they're back to being early buildings but they were actually built with cement and um, we've done kind of full mortar analysis and they were built with cement one of them over on the Isle of Lewis and actually it had decorative kind of um, pointing over the face of it decorative pointing taken over the face of the stone uh, but the building had been roofless for 20 odd years um, and it was Louis Louisian Nice so absolutely saturated conservation wise you know it's built with cement well actually you know you're trying to you know uh, conserve the original design intent and the original materials well if you do that you're not going to actually get the building working again um so that was quite an interesting one a quite an interesting conversation with HES and with the local authority how we actually need to get the cement out getting the cement out putting the line back in so the walls can breathe again but we couldn't repeat the kind of decorative mortars over the face of the stone because yeah. the line just wouldn't stay it would kind of weather away quite interestingly so that was an it was a technical to solve it we had to go to lime but we actually changed the character of the original building yeah so you're not tempted to um, build a brand new from scratch glass steel building <laughs> yourself no <laughs> I mean I do I enjoy the challenges of the mix of conservation and new you know mm -hmm. where uh, I think you know we've just done a, a kind of a design statement actually for a new planning application again another building over on Lewis where the existing building is really quite important but the client's brief you know we worked out quite quickly on that the client's brief didn't fit in the building yeah. um, without being incredibly brutal to the building so we kind of we went back to them and said well actually if you want what you want we need to consider going out with the building footprint um, so I think that I very much enjoy the combination of yeah. doing the conservation and then that new piece um, and then it's the link between the new and the old and it's trying to make sure that that's sympathetic to the to the old but then it's not pastiche and I think yeah. that would be quite an important balance because you know again people can be like well the existing buildings you know stone and da 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 so why can't the extension be stone and you yeah, know the yeah. same sort of characteristics and it's like well actually you've got to be quite distinct and of the time so again if you go back and say someone in 100 years time goes back and revisits that building they can understand the development of the building yeah so it sounds like you're all over the country with all your work and um what would be a typical day in the life for Penny Muir? <laughs> if, if such a thing as a typical day exists, it's probably different every day. It is actually. And again, I think that's one of the beauties of it. You know, I turn around and say this isn't a job for me. It's life. You know, I don't see being an architect as a job. It's I'm very lucky. What I do is my absolute passion. Uh, and, you know, some we weeks. that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and some weeks you know I, I can I can be off to the Isle of Lewis for three four days to site you know today I was down in Lossy Mouth and then I was back in Elgin you know last week I think I was through um I was through in Port Soy and you know it just is it's I think again that's what's quite exciting you can be in so many different places uh, looking at different buildings and there's different culture as well within that that I think is quite significant you know if you went to say Port Soy what's quite important in Port Soy may not be repeated over on the Isle of Lewis you know there's that kind of social association to architecture uh, and the cultural association that actually makes it very interesting as well yeah I mean I would imagine that your uh, sort of typical day has changed quite a bit in the last year or so so what has been the impact of COVID-19 on your working life and and sort of following on from that what do you perceive or foresee in terms of impact on the profession either in terms of sort of building design or next generation of um, sort of architects coming through so do you think there's going to be any impact from the pandemic yeah I think it's a very good question um so COVID for me I kept working through the big impact on the first lockdown was that the sites closed um and I have a lot like my typical day is I'm definitely on site at a point um so for the first lockdown it was you just went behind a computer screen and that was kind of it um and I miss the sites I miss touching the building you know being around it seeing the fabrics you know living it and just being behind a computer screen made it quite different um and I've never been one to sit behind a computer screen from you know eight 
six you know there's always something that breaks up that day um so yeah that was quite strange um and how did you find sort of working from home instead of being in that office environment did that sort of change anything or because everyone was working from home you were still able to communicate for me working from home hasn't changed has actually probably made been more beneficial I would say just with family life and such and um, when we were in the office again just with my typical day I could be on site in Elgin or I could be away to Port Soy or I could be you know down to Cromie Castle or off to the Isle of Lewis and um, so I would say my typical week before Covid I would have maybe been in the office 30% of the time if I was lucky for a full week so working from home hasn't really affected me on that I do miss my colleagues and just that kind of general you know that face-to-face -face. I think that yeah. interaction important but teams and zoom you know i think that's made things a lot more efficient in terms of meeting especially when you've got remote sites because you can keep in contact with your clients and um, i'd never heard of teams or zoom before <laughs> and you know that was one thing it's like wow this whole new world of technology i need to <laughs> learning but it had on that front you know it's been great to keep in contact with you know your colleagues to keep in contact with people and I think that uh, that has had many positives I think in terms of efficiency even you know with our carbon emissions what we're looking at in the next few years not necessarily having to jump in the car and drive to a meeting in Inverness purely because I need to be around a table yeah. you can now do it over the computer and um, so I think that's really important for the younger generations I think there's an interesting debate on it and I think an office environment is really really important and um, I think you've got so much to learn like being in that office environment hearing it listening it you you're breathing it and I yeah. think that's quite key and I think there could be a slight danger now in terms of the younger development and careers and um, there's a mix I think out there some youngsters were desperate to get back to the office some I think have been like oh it's, it's quite nice working from home yeah. but so do you then say well if you stay working from home you've got you know you could limit your career development opportunities whereas if you're in that office you've got more certainly if lockdown had happened for, you know I don't know 10 years ago I would have found it different and I would have missed the office for yeah. sure and what about, um, do you think there's going to be any difference in terms of um, design feeding off of this, you know, how we've changed, how we move about spaces? Do you think that's going to be any influence or people just want to put it behind them? I don't, I think it's going to be here to stay. Um, I'm not, I'm certainly not a doom and gloom monger at all, but I think, you know, the pandemic's been here for quite a while now. Um, it's really changed so much of our social you know interactions and everything from personal to office to such like and um, I think things will revert back to a normal but I think it will be a, a new normal and I think in terms of design you know are there going to be requirements for office spaces and things like that in town centres do they then become redundant now do you need to look at how offices work that can allow that flexibility I don't see working from home going completely but I see there need to be a development to the fact that you know for us example at LDM we are looking at uh, our office being our studio now so there will be kind of a, a mainstream staff there that is based there permanently and then there'll be staff that come and go so you can still have that interaction you can have that you know here's a scribble of a sketch what do you yeah. think as yeah. you're holding up the computer screen yeah. <laughs> but I think even in building operations and things like that you know facilities you know building regulations are obviously there and says this is what you require but our buildings going to be now existing buildings going to be think gosh we haven't gotten enough toilets or we don't yeah. feel like it's appropriate will it put visitors off you know do we need to adapt now to give that better um, yeah. I mean for them coming to the building so they feel safe trying to sort of future proof things a little bit yeah, yeah there will be a wee bit of that I think you know business models how different places work and operate now I mean you go to certain restaurants and things like that and you see the big screens and yeah. you know I know screens maybe are going to go but are they going to go do some restaurants think actually no we like them yeah. you know and even that, it's changed in a spatial environment um yeah, well, you've touched on there a little bit about the um sort of younger um, architects coming through what about um, any advice that you might be able to offer people who are thinking about pursuing a career in architecture 
I think, yeah, I think it's an amazing job. I, you know, personally, I think it can give you so much. It doesn't necessarily just need to be conservation. It, you know, I think there's so many challenges with new build. Um, you know, every day is different. There's always a challenge there, which is really quite interesting. I think it's hard, you know, please don't think that it's not, you know, seven, seven years, six years at university, and then you qualify, you've got another year and a half professional training, but um, is it worth it? Was it worth it? Gosh, yes. You know, yeah. very long hours at university, some late nights, but I would, I wouldn't necessarily rush. I would do it. If I had to say, right, go back to the start, would you do your career again? Yes, I would do it again. Mm -hmm. Would I want to do it again right now? Another seven years? No, thanks. But yeah. it was definitely worth the effort um, and the commitment. I think that's what it is. If you love it and you love your buildings, even if it's new builds, you know, and you're committed to that seven years, it's great. Um, and I think what's really, really important have it from the examiner side that I've seen is that once you come out of university is getting into the right job for what you want to do and your development. That's really, really important. Um, and I know that's been quite difficult over the last few years with just there's been obviously recessions in the, this, this industry and things like that. That's made getting jobs slightly harder and then people get a job and become very much like, oh, it's you know, we've got our job. We're safe. We yeah. can't move it. Yeah. Um, and I think it can be quite hard too if you're very very good at something that you can then be kind of put into that box sometimes as well and um, which can be quite quite tricky. Any practical tips um, things that maybe if there's people at sort of school age um, is there something good that you know how do, how do you sort of absorb or how do you learn or understand a little bit more about the sort of buildings around you or is there any um, particular sort of courses that you might recommend in terms of at a school level that would um, help you know should you be doing should be doing a bit of technical drawing at school or pick all that up later or yeah I think well oh gosh it's changed so <laughs> so much from when I was there but we had a subject craft and design um, and I absolutely loved it so you had the technical drawing but you also designed and made products I said oh, it is yeah kind of products so um, I remember making a chess set I made a kind of a table a little kind of um, that held books and things like that I made a fish slice <laughs> that was one of the early things but I think it's that drawing it and then making it you know it's that understanding of the processes that you go through and that I think is really quite important um the other thing I'd say I'd advocate is that attention to detail as well um you know again whether it's the building and the making it's you know really getting into it and knowing what you're you're studying I think that's really helpful interestingly when we first started university I think one of our first projects in first year was to go and measure a set of steps in Aberdeen <laughs> and we were like we're going to measure a set of steps in Aberdeen but it, it was really actually quite good once you've done it you understand it was quite simple but you understand how you've got to survey and measure something to be able to draw it up yeah um I think you know I don't know what courses are available in school but you know we've had some school kids coming into our office and they've done little projects at home where they've gone home and you know measured the house and drawn okay. it up and yeah. I think kind of challenging yourself to do little things like that, you can then actually understand what's involved in, in doing it. Um, but certainly from the conservation side, I kind of consider it, it's almost like building forensics. And I think that's what I love so much about it is you can go and I can just stand and look at a building, yeah. but it's spotting these little things that you know that's not quite right with the original design intent that then you can start to pull together that history. Yeah. Um, and to me that's fascinating and it's not just then the history of the building there's all the kind of social connections into that as well um and i think that's one of the things that i say when we're doing design statements now or heritage impacts assessments on historical buildings you know the society and the world has changed since these buildings you know say they were done in the 18th century 17th century um you know it's just, it, the building needs to adapt to meet that yeah. society needs that we've got today and it's how you make it adapt without destroying the architectural integrity but it needs to get that modern amenity into it otherwise it becomes a building at risk the only thing i'm going to throw in is uh, not don't forget to look up i think we sometimes just <laughs> look at things at street level and we forget to look up and see what's uh, up there so yeah. next time yeah. anyone's walking down through elgin town center look up at the uh, roof lines and the, see something a bit more interesting up there yeah, I mean, it's that's, I mean, I've taken clients that have come up from south and they've kind of walked down the conservation area and oh, it's Elk is really quite beautiful as so they're looking up. <laughs> now, we have got 
stunning buildings here you know yeah. at stunning buildings don't just look at the shops you know look up and actually understand some of these buildings and then you can see some of the interventions when you think my god what happened there? <laughs> you know um but that they they i find quite interesting because i've then gone and said well you know how did boots come about or how did uh, trespass or the car factory come about and you go back and you look at the buildings that were there and you think wow how did we yeah. lose it what, you know yeah, what we've lost yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to close our um, opening section with the um, same question we always ask. How do you ken Elgin Museum? <laughs> uh, how do I? So, yeah, LDN Architects have been involved in Elgin Museum. I think one of our first commissions with you was to uh, put new boiler, well, to do an LBC for the boiler, please. Um, and then in 2017, when the museum started looking at the cars project, I got involved in it and came along and I was just like, wow, this building's amazing. And yeah, I've been involved, thankfully, ever since. <laughs> thankfully, we're very thankful. You might want to get out of it soon. But yeah, we're very grateful for your help and your understanding of the building. So, so we know you've been involved with the Elgin Museum since 2017. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the history of the Elgin Museum building or buildings, I should probably say? Yeah, well, I, I guess that's one to, to many people know that it's a collection of buildings. Uh, the original form was actually quite different and it has grown over the years. So the main museum building, uh, that was built in 1842. But again, many people may not know that it was actually the third set of plans that were submitted uh, to the society for consideration. The first two were disregarded. Um, Have but you ever the seen those other two drawings? I have to find them. Oh, I wonder what they look like. That kind of stirs up your curiosity, doesn't it? <laughs> it again, that's... Like? So exciting about the job is that you know yeah. when you find out like, well, what did they look like what were they yeah. um but, you know I've kind of I've been through all your archives looking out to see what sort of plans and what information and you do have a lot of great archives <laughs> on the building um but yeah we never found any any information on the, the previous two schemes but both were kind of quickly dis disregarded because I think it started in 1838 I think the first set was submitted and then it was the 1842 plans that were then carried forward um, but it was just the main Italianate building, should I say, the kind of the tower, the main gallery, and then effectively the kind of the inner wings where we've got, again, the kind of the roof lighting coming down. Um, and I think one of the things I love the most about the building, although ironically, because it's a museum, is that the architect really considered daylight. Uh, and I know we we, a lot of the daylight has now been blocked off from some of the places, yes. but yeah. a lot of fantastic roof lighting. And I know you could you can imagine how bright and lovely the museum was at the time when it was completed. Um, and I think roof lighting can be so good because it just washes the building and then it can really show collections in another light, which is fantastic. But obviously, you've got to protect the, <laughs> the collections yeah. nowadays from light. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was in 1842. And then you've obviously got number three. I don't know, again, if many people know that number three High Street is associated with the museum. But there's a lovely is that a sketch. I think there's a lovely sketch in the archives of the, you know, the little kind of cottage with a thatched roof that used to sit on the site there. Yeah. Um, so what we've got now there, number three, is is early 19th century. Then the rear hall, I found the rear hall quite fascinating as well. The rear hall was 1896 and it actually had a double double pitch on it. So there was a central valley, um, but that then obviously started to push the walls out, which like, you know, around the building at the start, I was like, oh, wow, why have you got this huge big buttress? But, you know, the original <laughs> shape was putting too much pressure on that back wall, pushing it out. So obviously the intervention came in for this big buttress to go up to push the push the building back in. Um, and then in between there, you then had the extra galleries that were built on down the side of the museum uh, on the main Italianate building, um, which is quite interesting internally in the museum. Certainly in your, I was about to say, what is it, your West store, there's, you can see the original external openings within the interior of the building, which is really quite lovely. And uh, you've got those drawings actually in the archives, which show the steelwork that went in to create the big openings to kind of connect into these spaces, which are lovely, really lovely old hand drawings. Uh, 
Um, and then obviously in 1921, the side hill was built. Again, another example of beautiful roof lighting. Um, and I only discovered that there was a glass ceiling there because I was on the roof and we decided to open the roof light and the engineer just said he couldn't fit in the roof light. So he said, oh, you can, in you go. So I scrambled up the roof, went in the roof light, and went, whoa, there's a glass ceiling under my feet. <laughs> But luckily, I didn't stand on any of the panes. But, you know, that then I was like, wow. So the patent glazing on the pitched roof would then shine down. And then there was this fully glazed ceiling that would have just flooded that side hall with light. And it would have been amazing. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Um, but then obviously in the 90s, there's been a lot of change to the museum. Uh, the roof was actually then taken off the rear hall. And it's a kind of truss system that's now back on um, with the hipped roof. Uh, and then in the I'm jumping a bit back in the 70s, the the kind of suspended ceiling that you've now got in the side hall that was in in put in at that point, obviously, to kind of give you that artificial light. And, you know, the ceiling was obviously sealed up above it. So there's been a lot that's happened to the museum over the years. And it's it's fascinating to kind of see all those little bits and pieces. And then obviously there's been a lot of repairs over the years. The other thing from your archive that was fascinating, you keep a lot of your invoices. And yeah your work of notes. I think I found one in 1896, which was particularly lovely, really beautifully written, that was saying, oh, we've had a problem with a leak in the roof here. And then another few years, similar, we've got a problem with this junction. And I think that's yeah. probably one of the fundamental uh, difficulties with the architecture of the museum, because you've got all of these bits that have been added. You yeah. know, you've got all these new junctions where the, the new bit has added to the old bit and how have the junctions been treated. These junctions yeah. are perfect for water ingress and such like uh, but that's quite telling as well you know go through the archives find all these things or well, we've got problem we've got problem and you can say wow they've had a problem there for 150 years <laughs> yeah. and I think there were some invoices saying where some of the materials came from as well the roof slates and some of the stone I think the stone was from a was it from the bishop mill quarries I think it might have been yeah, yeah. you know um, a lot of people just assume if it's yellow sandstone it's a clash act but it's no it's from a completely different quarry no completely different quarry and actually that kind of leads it in quite nicely <laughs> when i did the fabric repairs um we were doing the fabric repairs in the 19 sorry 2017 uh the previous fabric repairs that had been done in the 90s they had put clash in now a clash act oh yeah it's a buff sandstone to look at it looks the same as a museum but clash act is actually a really really hard stone so when it was put in against the softer stone of the museum the original stone the harder stone then it's not as porous as the softer stone so it then sheds pushes more water into the softer stone and then actually causes decay in the softer stone so we were seeing where you've got these big slabs of clash act in perfectly good order well actually they were causing quite a lot of harm to the building you know and it, it's one of those hard things because it's like well that was a repair previously but actually it's causing damage so yeah. you know we need to take this back out and put something else in um which can be quite a tricky one and i think it's quite demonstrative of the fact that just because it looks the same type of stone there's actually a lot more again the kind of you know the technicalities to the different stone types to different mortar types and it's not just well that worked for that building or work for that one it looks like the same yeah. color yeah <laughs> each one is unique and it's got its own sort of uh, fabrics that work together or work against each other and yeah trying to get that balance exactly but yeah. i think that can Really quite interesting as well because you know you come to another building and it is you have to start from scratch and say right let's do another analysis of this and understand what the sandstone is you know quite often on buildings we do a lot of mortar analysis and um, interestingly one uh, one that's incredibly challenging that I'm working on at the moment we have discovered probably the hardest cement that very experienced material analysis has found in Scotland <laughs> wow really it's the hard and yeah I tried to chip a wee bit off when I was doing my initial surveys and I broke a tool trying to do wow. it <laughs> and I was like that's quite tough but I didn't realize you know how tough it was yeah. and now we yeah. need to get this stuff off <laughs> to yeah. let the build again that's um, a challenge yeah it is quite interesting that it's not just well I like a lion mortar I'll use it here I'll use it there well actually what suits the stone type mm -hmm. you know and it, it's all about porosity and People can say, oh, it's about breathability, but it's also about that kind of capillary action. You know, it's actually OK for water to go into an existing building. It will go into the fabric 
but it's about it coming back out. Coming it's out. About yeah interface that's okay if you've got your traditional lath, lath and plaster because it's got a cavity but it's it coming back out as well but that you know these existing walls they're designed and built that it can let it in and take it back out but as soon as you put a modern membrane either on the outside or on the inside that stops that you start to get some really quite big problems quite quickly yeah. Yeah. And so the architect for Elgin Museum was Thomas, the main buildings was Thomas Mackenzie. And am I right in thinking it was his, was it his son or his grandson that had done the side hall? Side hall? The AGR Mackenzie? I can't remember if that's his son or his grandson. I was about to say, because there was George Melvin, who did some additional work in the 1879, which I think was then the side wings. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, was it, hold on, yeah, 18, 1921. Alexander Marshall Mackenzie, oh, the museum, it, yeah. north, and that was in 1896. Yeah. It was to the north. Yeah, and that yeah, I can't remember if that is his son or his grandson, but it's a relative anyway. It's yeah, so it's a relative. We, we do know what we're talking about, honestly. But <laughs> I went, you know, sometimes and I, you know, you know in your head, and then you're like, gosh, so you think about so many different buildings and so many different dates, and it's like, yeah, is it the right one? <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, so. We've, we've, we've got ourselves up through the 1990s and you have spoken a little bit there about some of the more recent work. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you've faced uh, since 2017 and what how you've been involved uh, or what works you've been involved with with the museum? Yeah, so originally I came and did a bit of a fabric survey on the museum. The desirability, I think, at the time of the cars at the very start was that we were going to look at the side hall and we were going to do fabric repairs to the side hall. But then there were some complications that then said, well, actually, we need to divert to the main building. So we then kind of reanalyzed re it and delivered a scope of works for the main building. One of the key things there was, again, access because of the height of the tower and such like. We wanted then to focus on, we made the most use of the scaffold that we put up. So we focused heavily on high level stonework dropping down and really just saying, you know, the ground level, we can only go as far as we can with funds, but the ground level can all be reached, you know, on a future phase. Yeah. So you know there was a rationale behind that um we we from our survey you know we had good access onto the roofs we kind of designated a package of works and then scaffold went up and then always what we tend to do is once the scaffold goes up and we can actually touch and tap and get at the building we then do kind of another review of what of what we want to do and what that scope of works is but what we started to find not very much not initially but we started to see that there was actually some more problems there than what we would believed in terms of there was a, a series of repairs that were carried out in the late 80s early 90s and th again this is back to the clash hack that i touched on we started to find problems um that were causing inherent you know damage to the building uh, there was stone moldings i think one of the masons moved past and caught and suddenly the whole molding fell off because it had been glued to the building and we you know you can't have this at high level that if something yeah. can just touched and knocked you know a bird could come and get it and it could fall down and you know cause in injury so we found that and then we opened up some areas um in terms of there was a really nasty harl on the the west side um of the tower and we you know there was something quite strange about it and we thought well you know is this right and we started to chip away at that and then we found that the some of the coins had been cut back and they were literally like the domino effect on the coins there's just stacked one on top of the other and nothing tied in and we were oh <laughs> you know? i'm gonna say for those who don't know the coins are the corner stones carry on yes. <laughs> Stones. normally you have one that goes into the wall and then one yeah. that goes across the elevation so it kind of it knits everything yeah. together um but we found that they were just yeah it was a tower and you know <laughs> it's one of the things that they've sat there obviously since the 90s but as soon as you open up and actually realize that wow it, it's you know we're really lucky nothing more has occurred in these areas so we had to actually move things around quite cleverly within the contract to kind of, uh, you know, basically repair the areas that most needed it um, and focus on that. Uh, you might remember the the um, the rear elevation onto the the rear roof that you can see from the A96, and it was really heavily coated in cement. Um, a lot of the sandstone was deteriorating quite heavily. But we'd done a study of the original stone and we found a bit down the side. There's, if you go down the bracket, it's close, you can get up the side of the museum in a tiny little space. And we found the original uh, harling in there that, you know, it kind of further evidenced the fact that the back of the building was harled. 
and we found more pigments on the back of some of the stones. So we went back to the local authority and we said, look, we found all this evidence on site that actually it was hard. Um, so, yeah, that was really fantastic to actually bring back that original aesthetic to the rear elevation. It, it does now. You sit back and you think, wow, it, it really looks stunning. And the rubble stone underneath is protected. And we've replaced a lot of the damaged stone to give you that sharp edge of the um, of the dressings around windows and such like, which then obviously there's a technical reason behind it as well. So the harl can just go into that stone edge and there's a neat finish. It's not an exposed junction. Um, so, yeah, it was it was really, really interesting. There was uh, quite a few things on the roof that, again, I was quite shocked. Some repairs that I was like, really? <laughs> you know, someone's just put a little bit of DPC in and no slate. Um, and it's flapping in the wind. So you know, silicone going in places as well, wasn't there? Just, you know, yeah. a bathroom sealant that'll fill that gap. Yeah. <laughs> there was bathroom sealant up there. Yeah. And yeah, I think it just that kind of brings it home. It's like, you know, you can go on a roof and someone can do a repair and then come down and say to the client, well, the repair's done. And, you know, and unless the client says, well, I just want to go up my ladder and have a look, you know, yeah. you, you don't know what's up there. And there's a trust that you have in, in contractors to do that and do it right. And then when you see sometimes some things that may have occurred, it's, you know, it's, it's quite upsetting. Yeah. So am I right in thinking there was something like a over 150 repairs that had to be done on the rear hall roof alone? We so found on the rear roof, it, honestly, it was a bit like a needle in a haystack. But when you start crawling over the slates and tracing it, you can find the nail holes, you could find the silicon over the nail holes. And, you know, originally we'd wanted to just do, because we knew that it'd been reslated in the 90s, but we were aware from inside that there was leaks we had made an allowance to do slate repairs. But when we got up there and started to look at the slate repairs, we quickly discovered, you know, you're hitting the 150 plus, and that was what we could do. But we felt if you dug a bit deeper, you would find more and more areas that needed actually to be just stripped and replaced. Um, and again, that, you know, a roof that went in in the 90s and we're now, you know, 2020, well, at that time, 2017, 2018. Yeah. That's not long, you know, no, for that type no. of... It should last a lot longer. It should, and obviously we, we weren't able to do the full uh, re-roof at that time or tackle all of those leaks. And so we have continued to have some leaks and uh, yeah, we know now we have more work to do. And it, it's, a, it's a sort of never ending project almost, although I hope it might eventually end. <laughs> It will. I mean, that that's the thing. And that's one of my big kind of thing with fabric repairs. If it, it's getting that building up to a, a point and it may be it's a case of phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five, because that's realistic, you know, in terms of funding and doing the works. But once you hit phase five, as long as you continue maintaining your phases along the way, then, you know, it should just be regular maintenance. And yeah. You know, traditional materials are fantastic things and they looked after. They can last and last and last. I mean, some of the timber windows, you know, we've been called to do timber surveys, window surveys, and it's quite, I quite like it. I had to do one uh, down in near Granton on 140 windows. <laughs> Surveying 140 windows, it was, yeah, I enjoyed it for a few days. But, you know, the client originally there said, oh, just get rid of all the timber sash and case windows. We, you know, get rid of it all and we'll just put new in and we'll still slim double glaze it, it's B-listed, it's fine. That's what we want to do. And I said, well, actually, there's a huge value in the timber you've got because this old timber is properly conditioned. Um, and it's a case of actually maintaining and repairing those as opposed to slapping in the new, which, you know, within a few years, our new modern timber, it can be swelling, it can be sticking and you can, you know, it's not got necessarily the lifespan of what some of the old materials has. It's also got that embedded carbon in it as well. So sort of thinking about uh, being more conscious of, of the climate yeah. is is these older buildings, the materials, they've already been quarried or the timbers already been felled. Uh, and so they've, they've already got that kind of embodied. So to, to remove it and to, you know, landfill it, to replace it with something modern, um, you know, this, this doesn't sort of balance things out there, does it? We asked you um, in the aftermath of the cars work, which we were delighted with, um, we asked you to help us to plan because we want to make sure we can look after all of our buildings. And we did ask you to um, do a survey of all of the stock, of the, all of the building stocks, so number three, the main building number one and the side hall, and to help us develop a 10 year plan. And uh, things didn't quite work out as something that we could do over 10 years of it. <laughs> 
No, no, I mean, that again, that's the challenge is it's the funding and it's understanding these buildings and it's the catch 22, I find, because, you know, the buildings can deteriorate, but you're then trying to get funding in place. But then the longer it takes, the building deteriorates further. Um, and albeit, you know, you could turn around and say, oh, and we have, we've discussed, obviously, the roof came off number three because there was an incident, it was nail sick and slates were coming down onto the public road. So there was a problem with health and safety there. So the decision was to strip it and to felt it as a temporary measure. But at the time, there was a discussion, well, do we actually just redo the roof? Um, and, you know, that was our kind of question. It's like, do you just redo the roof? But actually, what do you want to put back in number three? Because mm -hmm. do we redo the roof? And then actually what you want to do with number three means alterations to that roof. Um, and do you, you when you start to do the roof you then start to look at the chimneys and the skews yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know i think that's where you've got to be really careful as well that yeah, you know yeah. if you identify a scope of a project you need to know what budget it is and it needs to be realistic and there needs to be contingencies there uh, and i think that can be the danger if you you know oh we'll go for the project and then it just yeah. grows and grows and it just doesn't stack up yeah, well, that was, you know, we'd asked you to sort of help us to prioritise and so we could tackle the most urgent things first. And it turned out everything was in the urgent bracket. So although we haven't um, managed to get to the actual physical work yet, we've kind of developed that further with you and you've helped us kind of bring together. Hopefully a package of works that will help us um, not just fix the problems, but to make the spaces that we have better and more usable. So I think that's, you know, for us as an organisation, that's something we're really excited about coming forward. And we hope that our viewers and our um, the museum supporters will um, continue to support us during this and uh, hopefully be understanding if and when we can get ourselves started. And it's going to be, um, yeah, we look forward to seeing how we can make the space um, more usable and more sustainable and try and help us sort of continue for another hundred years. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic set of buildings. You know, to me, it's it's what's well, number one high street is part yeah. of the pinnacle conservation area, you know, um, and I think sometimes you can feel like well, we're at the end and we're tucked out, you know, from yeah. the rest of it. But you're not. It's it's a really, really important. It's category A listed building um, and, you know, there's a lot of social and cultural significance in that building that needs to be protected. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what you say, you know, everything became urgent and it is, it's you're then balancing up, you've got to protect the collection, you're trying to deal with health and safety. But again, it's going back to the point originally when we did the cars work and we said, right, we'll put the scaffold up, but we're trying to make use of the scaffold. And that's what we tested with the report. Well, if we put a scaffold up, but it's only getting that bit of urgency, we can't get that bit of urgency because that's on number three. So we end up, you're scaffolding the whole thing and it becomes a really big project to try and do it at one time. Yeah. Well, they say we're really excited about um, continuing to develop the museum's building, sort of continuing that legacy of the architects that have gone before and uh, we'll make our own changes, hopefully, and make it better. But as you say, the museum is number one high street. It's the start of um, the east edge of the Elgin uh, historic core and the conservation area. I know you've done a lot of work in other buildings within the town centre and we obviously mentioned that you've done the survey work for in advance of the car scheme. So, I mean, how does the museum building compare to other buildings within the city centre in terms of sort of style, period quality? Uh, how much more has Thomas Mackenzie done in, in the, the high street area? I'm not, I can't think of anything else within the core. I know he did he build Lady Hill House. I know that was his house. Um... But 100% sure if he did, but yeah. I don't think he's more he did in the core. Um, yeah. I think the... he's also responsible for the uh, Italianate church in Forest. So there's a church yes, in Forest that has that same bell tower almost that we've got, the kind of Campanile. So he's done that one, but. Quite a few similarities in terms of the architecture between them. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, do you want to tell, talk to us a little bit more about um, the other buildings in the Elgin Town Centre and some of the other buildings that you've been involved with? Yeah, well, the cars projects. Wow, I think I, I surveyed 33, 33 buildings with 33 owners, but a lot of buildings in the town centre. Um, and it was quite interesting as part of the cars project, the Murray Council had designated the priority buildings within that um, because of the state and actually the historical importance as well. Um, so that was really quite interesting. So we were commissioned initially to do it through HES and uh, the local authority to do all these surveys and it 
included uh, me at 6 a.m. on a cherry picker on a Sunday morning in Elgin High Street. <laughs> you know, I was like, I never thought I would be up at this point, uh, you know, zooming around the high street going up and down. But it's, it's brilliant. And I think, you know, that bird's eye view is so invaluable to see some of these properties. But it was really, really interesting. And I think doing all of those surveys made me fall in love with Elgin you know it is a beautiful centre and it's got such a rich history again I don't know how many people know but it was a very rich merchant town and they used to just knock buildings down you know beautiful buildings they would just take them down and then build another one Thornton's yeah. that stay at what was Thornton's and it's now Highland Mobile I think yeah it's Highland Mobile because they painted it bright green much to my yeah. upset to be removed <laughs> cars um, that was a stunning building, absolutely beautiful, but it came down and then they built that, you know, so there was a huge amount of wealth in the town. And I think some of the architecture that still does remain is reflective of that. But the cars project was really, really interesting. And actually there was similarities in the museum work that we did um, in the fact that we did survey work and we found a lot of inappropriate past repairs that it was a case of trying to unpick some of these and, you know, clients were like, but what, what's happened? <laughs> you know, what's happened up there? And I was like, would you want to come up and see? And, you know, they were astounded by some of the things we started to uncover and unveil. And I think that, again, it's that it's quite upsetting to see that this is what's happened to the building, this is the treatment that's happened to the building. And then the clients are saying, well, we only did that, you know, five, 10 years ago. And it's like, well, <laughs> no, the water that's coming in, it's coming from this. Um, and some of the chimneys, actually, they were terrifying. You know, you went up to chimneys heavily coated in cement and what was actually holding that chimney together. But if you took some of the cement away, the weight that's in that cement, you put it, you drop it onto the scaffold, it's quite a clang, but if it went any further, it's, it's, it's quite worrying. Yeah. But it was really enjoyable. We took 17 projects to site in the end through that and did all the repairs and did it, you know, it, uh, uh, the cars officer asked in the end, has, has it made a difference? It has made a difference. Could we do it all again? Well, we could do it all again, probably with another 17 easily. Um, but I think one of the most significant that came out of that was we uh, I had done a survey on 161 to 163 High Street, now known as Panland, um, but they never took up the cars at the time but it was listed as a priority building um however we were then working on the building next door doing the chimney repairs and we realized it was in a terrible state that building was completely clad in uh, cement the chimney was and when you went through the cement there wasn't really much stone left it was just dust but we couldn't take that chimney down without taking the chimneys next door down which interestingly you know led to next door and then uh, we started to come down that building, understanding the condition of it. And it was, yeah, really quite eye opening to think that it had been standing for so long. And some of the condition of the stone hadn't caused much bigger problems in the long run. Um, but that's another Italian eight building that was, um, I say, 18, I think it was 1856. That one was built. So not long after the museum. And it was, um, interestingly enough, commissioned by the Royal Bank of Scotland. They only lasted in it for 20 years. Again, this is where I think it's actually so important to understand the social history of a building, not just that's the that's the traditional building. But they commissioned it, interesting enough, with a local architect, um, A.W. Reed. But the Royal Bank of Scotland had their set architects through Scotland. It was that was their art, like the Northern Art uh, Lighthouse Board had their engineers. Um, Royal Bank of Scotland had their architects, but they didn't. They went with the local architect to build this building. Um, but they only stayed there for 20 years and it was their test site to come into Elgin. So they built this lovely building, beautiful corner site to see if they were going to be, you know, they could um, set up in Elgin. They clearly could. And then they commissioned um, just along the road, I think it's 140 High Street, where Starbucks is now using their typical Royal Bank Scotland architect. Yeah. <laughs> and it's got similar characteristics to Poundland as we know it today. Um, so I, I've always kind of questioned that. Did they just throw up the building at uh, 161 to 163 High Street as a test? Because we're like, oh, we'll just get from this quarry. It may not be the best stone, but let's put it up. You know, it's a lovely building see how it goes and then yeah 20 years later we're working so we move to another site because the building's not the best of condition um and that one i think has been that's been a fantastic building it's been incredibly challenging i could i could give you a whole lecture on how challenging <laughs> but it's had a very interesting history as well from when the royal bank of scotland moved out it was the bank at ground floor and then had housing above it and um, but it was then also a temperance hotel okay. um, and then 
it became the home of the Elgin New Club, which I thought was quite quite hilarious. From the the Temperance Hotel, no alcohol, you know, none of that. And then the Elgin Club moved in, the Gentlemen's Club. <laughs> We were there until Woolies took it over in 1926 and then that was it. When Woolworths bought the site in 1926, they made a lot of changes that sadly um, added to some inherent flaws that just you know, the building's downfall, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, thankfully not literally downfall yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. We're on the way down, but yeah. uh, we're on the way down in a controlled manner. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The most I mean it's going to make such a difference when that is completed I know a lot of people locally will sort of probably be cursing all the scaffold and the cranes that have been there but it's trying to you know it takes a lot of time to do these buildings of these scale doesn't it to do it right and safely and you know when it goes back it's it's not just going to be a, a shop there's going to be housing isn't there and yeah exactly I mean it's I know people are fed up with the scaffolding it's been there <laughs> I can't believe we've been there for three years. <laughs> but, you know, we have been deconstructing it since the end of last year, mostly really the start of this year. The crane came in in February. But, you know, it's been an eye opener into how Elgin's been built. Again, historically, a lot of the buildings on Elgin's High Street, they were a lot lower than they are now, quite a few of them. And they tended to just build up and build up. And that has been the integral thing that we've, the biggest challenge we've had on this site is the fact that there was actually a 17th century Georgian house on the site before this building. And um, they were obviously to a height. And then the Masons came along and decided to demolish that. But the one next door, 167, which most people probably know still as Clancy's, they were a low building, one and a half story. But they decided then, oh, actually, we're going to build a wee bit on top of the Georgian building next door. So the Masons came to take down the Georgian house ready to clear the site for the bank and found this integrally connected wall. Oh, it's fine. We'll just put a lot of masonry up and tuck it in and it's <laughs> fine. So what we found as we've started to take it down, we've been finding the 17th century wall and it's been coming out underneath the wall of the next door of the building. <laughs> You know, so we've had to stop and take, you know, calculated decisions in terms of how to make sure that we will structurally support the next door building, keep our site safe, keep everything moving. I mean, we've got, which is fascinating, we've got 3D monitoring that we've had in, again, before we started the deconstruction, we put that in onto site where we've got little prisms. Some people may see Ariane every Friday morning with his kit set up on the plain stones, taking measurements from these prisms to prove that none of the buildings there, well, the building next door Clancy's is moving mm -hmm. towards our site. So we monitor that on a weekly basis. And if we find any movement, obviously it's red alert. Um, but, you know, there's that kind of level of detail to it. It's not just, oh, we're going to the building with a wrecking ball and just take it down. Yeah. Uh, we've also been taking away some of the stone, which sadly we cannot save because the condition is so poor. But we are taking the templates of all the stonework as it comes down, the key mouldings, so that when we rebuild that we can replicate what was there. Yeah. And then that's a really important aspect to remember as well, that down taking is, yeah, that material is coming down where you can, you'll put it back. So it's all got to be carefully numbered and plotted out. And so when it goes back, it's in the right order. And it's, it's, it is like I say, it's not just a wrecking ball. It's having a bit more sort of attention to detail and, and a bit more of conscious effort. And, and yeah, it takes time, but the end result will be definitely worth it, I would say. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it is. And we've had archaeology in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> Many people wouldn't know there was actually a basement under there. And um, there is a basement under there. We went through this lab. We knew we'd actually from our surveys before we got near the contract, we knew it was there. We didn't know how big it was, um, but we'd done some cores. So we knew it was under there. But and we knew that the original facade had been collapsed in and under there and then slab poured on top. But we found some fantastic stone that's come out. You know, it's not fully, but it's part of the original capital from the Ionic opening to the bank. And, you know, pulling some of that stuff out, it's been amazing to see. You know, this yeah. has been underground for 80 years and actually it's really quite well preserved. Uh, we did actually have um, a large fragment of a medieval jug. Um, we had a picture of that up in our number three window display over may until just this last weekend and that on the um index card says it came from woolworths 
Really? Well, yeah. So it must have been when they were first doing their work there, went to, to convert into Woolworths and some of the work they've done there. This it's a, it's a piece about this size. It's really quite a substantial and very lovely piece of medieval pottery. But, you know, from a, an archaeology side of things, it's just sort of um, highlighting again that we've got these later buildings, 19th century, etc., 20th century, some of them. But actually those medieval um, street patterns are, are still respected and, and still surviving below ground level. I, I, I know you really love the closes in Elgin. Do you want to tell us anything more about the, you know, how we've got that set up? We've got the high street, but maybe people aren't aware of the, the sort of herringbone of closes that come off of it. Yeah, I mean, the closes are wonderful. Um, and that was one of the things with the cars that they'd hoped to kind of do more into the closes. But I think sadly uh, they, that, that kind of didn't really manage to happen. Um, but the closes lead to so much character. Um, one of the challenges in the, the town centre is, uh, you know, everyone's got their shop fronts, but how do you get to the upper levels? And that's why a lot of the upper levels are abandoned because you can't get access off the street to the upper levels. And some of them they still can because they've got the closes and things like that. And, you know, it's that kind of the closest. I've read so many stories about the closes in the past and they actually weren't particularly nice places. Yeah. <laughs> Historically, um, they could be really quite awful, um, but I think there's such, you know, that's part of the townscape, that's what makes Elgin, you know, that's all the connectivity um, back from, you know, from the High Street up to South Street. And some of them have been lost, which I think is quite interesting if you look at some of the historical planning, you know, there was a lot of good connections between the High Street and South Street. One of my favourites is the old Victorian market, I think all of that kind of area in the jailhouse, which now is very much landlocked, you know, there used to be some fantastic connectivity up there and then a, there was another connection from Batchen Street again into the market at that point um so yeah it's all it just gives another level of character and historical character to Elgin um people wouldn't know that actually probably North Street was a really important street in Elgin it had some of the most beautiful big villas and houses running down it uh, and they all got knocked <laughs> you know <laughs> And it's really quite sad, you know, they had, you know, the raised basements with a big flight of stairs going up to your kind of your, your principal level. And, you know, that was the main artery from Elgin to Lossie. And you wouldn't know it now. You kind of North Street is I know it's been closed for three years, but, you know, if it reopened, what is North Street now? It's it's not that really important street, a very wealthy street in Elgin that's yeah. been lost with huge intervention from the 1940s to the 80s. And then obviously, in the uh, the late 80s, the 1996, it yeah. took away. And again, I don't know if people realise, I think if you look at some of the historical maps and even the aerial photos, how much it cut the city in two. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's quite sort of staggering. You see how much has been lost and uh, 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 progress obviously has got to happen and, you know, different attitudes over different generations. But um, it's good to see a lot more of the historic buildings in the town centre being brought back into use and, and hopefully we'll get some more of these vacant and derelict buildings um, kind of opened up again because it really kind of just helps to bring the town centre to life, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the big, Batchen Street has done fantastic, you know, all the little businesses that have opened up there. And, you know, I think there's a bit of support amongst them, you know, because one's got there, they're busy, another one's opened up, it shares that of level of business um, and that is just it's made it fantastic and we need to try and get that to repeat into the high street a little bit and encourage more to you know I could see the plain stains you know a lot of people could spill out onto the plain stains enjoy the plain stains because it's a fantastic place you know yeah. and again it's a bad place to sit and look up and think oh beautiful buildings you know yeah. it's actually a really lovely environment but it's starting to get that to go yeah. um, it's really important and as I touched on earlier it's the access to the upper levels and you know I've been in buildings where I'm like oh how do we go upstairs oh there's a hatch, hatch. Yes. <laughs> or oh there's that oh, this, we have that in number three don't you? you go through the magic picture in the wall and it takes you upstairs <laughs> yeah I mean when you when I six, you know I went in and I was like that I go through that <laughs> yeah. and it's something out of the witch in the wardrobe but it's yeah. just like hey I open it up and then wow there's a staircase you yeah. know and it, it's things like that and you know you can't be judgmental to a huge degree on what decisions have been made in the past and they've been made in the past yeah. because of certain reasons and we're not party to those reasons so we can't be overtly critical we can come in now and say well our judgment is 
you know you shouldn't have done that or that shouldn't have been like that yeah. and that's yeah. easy to do but there may have been rationale behind it at the time but that seems to be a lot of the problems with the buildings in the high street is that you know the shops are fantastic doing well at ground floor level they shut the door on what's above and they don't know what's up there yeah. uh, but it's trying to get you know I know that the council is driving to get more residential into the spaces above but I, again I think as it's really important that if you're trying to do that people understand how the old buildings work it's not just necessarily a case of oh yeah we just laid loads of insulation in da, 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 da. we've got a lovely building because you can then end up with certain issues with damp and things like that and actually your new space can become quite unpleasant quite quickly um if you're not kind of dealing with the wider picture of the building yeah yeah well let's hope that there's um, more improvements to come for the city center yeah, I think, well, the master plan coming and hopefully it's going to bring a lot to the town centre and, you know, it's such a vibrant centre. There's so much that can and so much that it can give. And I think the more that it can be celebrated in the future, it'd be great. There's so many brilliant industries up here as well, you know, um, and a lot of opportunities for the young as well. Try and keep them up here as opposed to heading off to the central belt. Yeah. OK, well, as ever, we will finish our conversation, sadly with seven quick questions which as ever require seven quick answers and we have had to tweak these slightly to uh, fit in with today's theme but our first question is a, a as one that our audience will know what's the one thing you wish you'd known when you began your career if there is anything you, you knew oh, i don't know if there is you know i think it's maybe that's a bit of a, a strange answer but i think it's been a journey and i mm -hmm. think it's been a fantastic journey a learning journey all the way through so yeah. i didn't yeah. think i'd have wanted to know too much at the start yeah. it's embracing played. all the ups and downs and yeah yeah that makes it what it is yeah great uh here's the, this one might be a bit more difficult uh what's your favorite film or book about <laughs> or featuring architecture architects historic buildings heritage if you have one gosh yeah <laughs> um there is i don't know so much of it's a film there's probably plenty of films um coming to mind but, but no there's a, there was a fantastic documentary but it's maybe kind of it's architectural and archaeology on pompeii that um i don't know how many years ago it was quite a while ago and actually i went to the cinema to see it <laughs> <laughs> but it was amazing it was right back on the history of Pompeii and uh I would say probably there's lots of films where I've got buildings I like in it but that documentary on Pompeii really stuck in my mind in terms of the development of Pompeii and obviously what happened in Pompeii and things like that it was really really interesting I, I would love for anybody in the comments below the video if you have a favorite film or book about or featuring architects or architecture let's see what it is add it to the uh, comments below i did start to come up with two or three and uh, I thought, yeah well let's see if anyone else can come up with anything so sure. <laughs> I, I, well i think the lake house is uh the character is an architect i've got a feeling that in decent proposal i feel like there's an architect i think wouldn't woody harrelson an architect in that i might have imagined it <laughs> but definitely the lake house that's an architect one <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny. I know some of my colleagues would probably give, give you hot fire. Dung, 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 dung. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's funny. The one time when I go and watch films, it's like, woof. It's yeah. That's my shot off point. <laughs> I think I've got a book. I I want to say it's by someone called. He's definitely called Daniel. I want to say maybe like Liebwitz or something. He's an American yeah. architect. That is an amazing book. I is that his autobiography? Yeah. I've read it. I've got. And it's a really good book very emotive yes it makes you want to be an architect if if so maybe that's the inspiration for anyone who's thinking about a career get that book and read it yeah no it, it yeah that is a really good book yeah um okay we've got diverted there uh question three what building anywhere in the world would you like to have had the opportunity to work on either when it was originally being constructed or, you know, going in and kind of doing interventions now, either a building or even a, a cityscape. That's a really tough one as well, because <laughs> I would say any period in history as well. So, you know, <laughs> so many buildings out there I admire. I am. Um, I could actually, do you know what? I'd probably go back. To, I would go to Rome 
and I would love to work on some of those buildings. I would love to, you know, actually just take myself back in a wee time capsule to see the Coliseum going up and, you know, I just sit there in my bubble and watch it. I think yeah. some of the buildings in Rome, some of the churches, you know, the Vatican, things like that, I could happily just sit and watch it. Yeah. I think yeah there's some there that would be amazing to work on I would love to and the challenges actually of a hot climate would be really quite interesting um there's also just it's I'm not one that it has to be by this architect or I have to have this style you know I kind of feel again there's a kind of natural flow on what buildings I like when I was over in Cuba there's some amazing buildings out there as well in terrible terrible conditions and yeah. I would love to them you know don't particularly know who designed them who built them yeah. possibly not anyone that's got much written about them mm. but the architecture is incredible yeah. um so yeah that I yeah I'm not picky yeah. <laughs> well you did mention um the option of being a vet earlier but we always ask what profession other than your own would you like to attempt so even now if there's is there something else that you sort of think I might, I might quite like to have a go at uh, something different. Yeah, the only thing I'd probably say, um, so the vet was when I was younger and then when I was kind of tossing up at university, when I was applying to university, it was going to be either uh, criminal law or <laughs> um, architecture. <laughs> quite different, okay, yeah. Different. Well, quite different, but not necessarily because there's that back to that kind of forensic yeah. and you know, the research and that side of it. Um, but it's quite interesting. I think, you know, a lot of people I spoke to said you could be really good at it, but it would yeah. have made you a lot harder person for yeah. it, kind of being in that environment. Um, I think I would have enjoyed it. Again, it's something, okay, it's more behind a desk, but there's a, you know, you're always dealing with different cases and things like that. So, it, you know, to me, that's what's always been important. I'm not doing the same thing day in, day out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I certainly, I think that side of things, the criminology and the forensics would have possibly been my other way, but would I have had the stomach for it? <laughs> I don't know. You certainly look happy in architecture anyway, so, yeah. that's, so it's definitely the right choice, I think, yeah. I do, I <laughs> um, what, this might be an odd one, what's the strangest request you've been asked to incorporate into a design? Oof. Um... That's a good question. I've had um, <laughs> I've had some strange moments over the years. I'm trying to think about any strange requests. I've had moments where I've been in buildings with clients and they've said, oh, if I'm sitting on the loo, as they promptly go to sit on the uh, our loo. <laughs> 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 really? um, but has there been any strange requests? I've done some strange specifications as well, which mm -hmm. um, some of my colleagues can't believe and some of my masons really probably um, curse <laughs> for. But, uh, I don't know, cow dung, uh, it can okay. be a charge coat. So if you've got a lot of, if you've got a historic building and a chimney's been very damp and there's a lot of soup coming through, um, you can't really get that soup out. You can't just suck it out. So there can always be staining coming through to the inner finish. But if you use a mix of cow dung and, and water <laughs> to do like a charge coat over the wall, yeah. it works. Yeah. Um, did the masons thank me? They had to go and get some of the freshest. <laughs> What's the specification? <laughs> and, uh, I went on site when it was uh, when they were applying it, and the smell yeah. was yeah quite something. But you now go in the building and it's beautiful. And can you smell it? No. Has <laughs> stain and come through? No. So you know, I think that again historically can be really quite exciting. You can come across some old tried and tested specifications, and yeah, I raised a few eyebrows doing it, but it worked. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, question six. What's the one common myth about your profession that you'd want to debunk? Uh, what's a common myth? Um, that's a good question. I had a client today that actually just said that he, he commonly doesn't like architects. <laughs> <laughs> um, because he just feels that they, you know, they want to put their design on a client and yeah. that thing that I'm really firmly against I think you know to be a good architect it's not about you or your arrogance you know you, yeah. you, uh, it's all about the client and the client's brief and yeah there may be times when you're talking about a historical building and the client doesn't want to do things or doesn't understand it but you you have to tell them that and um, but you know to make a good architect to me is if a client gives you a brief and at the end of the day you've delivered that brief and the client, you can go back at the end of the rectification period 12 months later and the client's like, I absolutely love it. Yeah. You know, so happy. And that to me is the joy of the job. You know, yeah. we 
there to to give to them yes we're to guide them and take them along the journey but it's not for us to say this is what you must have you know I think interestingly today that client that was his thought of an architect and I think yeah quite a few people can sometimes think that yeah okay last question you've done well uh what is your must visit building or city oh do you have one that you you could just go back to time and again yeah yeah I just um I can I've gone over there with uh, my mother a few times (laughs) and uh I've taken her through the the palladium and all of this and yeah no I've driven her mad and like one time I was there she had to just go and sit under a tree because it was so hot she's like really do we have to go around this again I said yes (laughs) yes you know to me that level of history and uh, you know I know the buildings some of them are lost now or that just remains but I absolutely love it yeah. I just get so much enjoyment of it but don't get me wrong I do love going to other cities and seeing lots of other buildings but yeah. you know, that's my kind of I think there's so many cities in Italy that just yeah you can spend hours in and if no one's been to Pisa go up go to Pisa and go up the Leaning Tower of Pisa because it's quite something it yeah. really you really do lean <laughs> you know? and you're going this way and then you're going that and it oh, yeah. Quite realize until you've gone up it actually yeah. how much it's leaning <laughs> well congratulations you got through our seven cook questions and it wasn't as bad as you thought it was going to be <laughs> um so thank you once again for taking the time to speak with me this evening uh, and i hope that our viewers enjoy this episode of elga museum in conversation thank you very much